It's a beautiful day out there, you know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Could do it outside. You want to have class outside today? Yeah, okay. that'd be good, wouldn't it? Yeah, right. I used to love that when I was at I school. Know. And they Me said, too. we'll do class outside. Yeah. It brings you back, doesn't it? It does. You have it your does. coffee? I got my coffee, thank you. Okay. So what should we talk about? Well, I wanted to start talking about, you know, last night when you introduced the film... About the romantic comedy that I'm doing next? <laughs> <laughs> Step Brothers 2? <laughs> Internship 2? <two>. Yeah. <laughs> two of my favorite movies of the year. <laughs> <laughs> this is a true story. My son is 15. When I... Because I, I, I had to wear a suit, you know. So I tried it on. I, I almost never wear a suit. I didn't even wear a suit when I got married. He said, this is absolutely true, he said, you know what, you wearing a suit, Dad, is funnier than Step Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> it's a true story. Um, yeah, we can start off with the romantic comedy angle. What do you think it'll be like working with Kieran Knightley? Be great. That's a joke. I'm so, looking forward to it. Okay. I Just love her, I think she's really good. She is excellent, but yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, she is. So, last night when you introduced um, the film, you referred to the, the days when you were in New York and you were working with a theater director, mm -hmm. studying with a theater director, someone. No, no, I wasn't studying. Okay. Um, he, he, he. Uh, uh, I went to school with his son, mm -hmm. and uh, when I left school, I was, I'd have been about eighteen, not even. It's just about eighteen. And uh, it was the days of Laker Airlines. I don't know if you remember that. It was the first low-cost airlines. Freddie and it Laker. had a very, very big impact on people of my generation because it was the first time that Brits had been able to come to America, f you know, because it was cheap. Uh, and he, you know, nowadays we have Virgin Airlines, but in those days it was unheard of. You could fly to New York for 59 pounds. That's like $75 or something. Occasionally it felt like the engines might fall off, but that's a different <laughs> story. Um, but it, it, it opened up America for people of my generation. And uh, I came to stay with Carmen Capalvo, who was a, a brilliant theater director now, sadly died not so long ago. Um, but a great, great man and a great New Yorker, and he he really was instrumental in creating the off-Broadway movement. He he opened the Three Penny Opera in the 50s off in a theatre off-Broadway and turned it into a hit. That was unheard of, never happened before. And uh, I was 18, and in those days when you were 18, you were a lot younger, I think, than 18-year-olds are today. Yeah. And he lived in a rather beautiful apartment on East 11th Street. And I just remember it. You know, I stayed there three, well, pretty much every summer I used to come here from college. And it was like entering a world that of unimaginable excitement, you know. You'd be thinking of directing this play or that play and there'd be writers and directors and producers, and they all used to go off to Elaine's. Do you remember? Is that still going, Elaine's? Yeah, yeah. Shut down a couple of years. yeah, I can remember him taking me to Elaine's. I thought that was about as exciting an evening as I'd ever had. Well, he used to play poker. All these men, you know, playing yeah. poker. Yeah. And, uh, and they talked about books, and they talked about, uh, you know, great American writing, you know and Eugene O'Neill, and Nelson Algren. I can remember Carmen reading me, Walk on the Wild Side. You had a, you had a most beautiful spoken voice. You always used to say, speak up, speak up, speak up, speak up, God damn it, speak up. Because <laughs> all British people mumble. And, uh, uh, and I hero worshipped him, I really did. I, I, I hero worshipped him and that sense that you made your life your own and you enjoyed great successes and also less than successes, but in the end you greeted the world each day with, with what was possible. And, and it seemed unimaginably romantic. And, and he used to say to me, you gotta go for it. You, if you've got the dream, go for it. You know, he, he was a great believer in that. 
And uh, I've never forgotten those days. And, you know, I used to see Carmen right up to the end. He was a great, great man and a great New Yorker and a, a most one. I mean, he taught me everything that I know about this city. I mean, it's what such little that I do came. And you, you referred a couple of times last night to the East Village. You spent a lot of time there. It was a very yeah. different place back then. It was. What I remember was the Strand Bookstore. Yeah. Um, bear in mind, it, you know, today when you come to London, enough, my wife and I were, were out walking yesterday. We were saying New York now doesn't seem that far away from London. Yeah. It's, you know, you, you, a lot of the same experiences now. But... In those days, it was different. Yeah. You know, to go to the Strand Bookstore was just the most exciting thing. Mm. You know, and to look for poetry and old Nelson Olgren novels, and um, and I remember the record stores in the East Village where you used to buy bootlegs. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. Every single Hendrix album you could possibly imagine. Mm -hmm. Every single <laughs> Hendrix performance would be there, you know. I must have bought them all, I think. Yeah. By the time I'd finished college. <laughs> they were, most of them were unlistenable too, but I thought they were just great. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they were happy, happy days. And also pedestrian days, that was the other thing. You know, you walked everywhere, mm -hmm. you know. But it gave me, and I was also obsessed with photography at the time. I took photographs all over the city. Um, I loved it. It was, it was, it was, had a powerful effect on me. It had a very, very powerful effect on me. So what was the, the pathway from there to making your first movie? Um, it's funny, it's something that I've thought about a lot recently. Why, why do directors end up directing, you know? It's sort of funny, isn't it? Because it's, it's a weird job. Nobody, I think, in the entire history of directing has ever had somebody ever come up to them and go, you look like a really good director. I'm going to hire you. <laughs> it never, ever happens. <laughs> so that you start with that. It's a self-selecting job. So you have to be either unutterably vain or, or entirely mad, and probably both. Um, you know, you have to have that desire to do it. So where does it come from? Well, I think that childish, ex profound childish experiences of cinema I think are a, a common factor. I don't, and you know, then you have to delve deeply into why your imagination is so moved to want to repeat those. But I can remember very, very distinctly. You know, I was a, I grew up sort of an hour out of London in in a, you know, pretty grotty sort of part. Not not a horrendously grotty, but it was a was a windy, vacant estuary town about an hour from London and people didn't become directors from Gravesend believe me um, if you want to know Gravesend is where um, is where Oliver Twist is set Oliver Twist starts on the marshes Great Expectations starts on the marshes that's where I spent my early childhood um, but I do remember being taken to movies and going to movies. I can remember Saturday matinees. And in particular, I remember my dad, who was at sea uh, one way or another all his working life. Um, so he was quite remote, you know, because he was away a lot, certainly when I was, you know, my, very young. Um, but he had one thing that was very important, I think. He, he was self-educated, he'd left school at 14, but he had a belief that, that no matter what the piece was, 
of, of art, if you like, that you should experience it no matter what the age. He didn't have a sense that you were too young to experience things. And what that meant was that I can remember uh, utterly, utterly vividly being taken to see Hamlet, and I would have been about eight. And it was a very, very famous Hamlet. It was uh, David Warner's Hamlet, uh, Peter Hall's Hamlet, uh, when he was running the Royal Shakespeare Company in London at the old Vic. And it was, it was a really raw blood-soaked Hamlet and a story of revenge and and I remember it as the one of the most compelling sort of experiences of my life dramatic utterly moving utterly enthralling utterly violent I can remember him taking me to see Zhivago Lawrence of Arabia and Zhivago and I can remember that we didn't watch it in the home in our hometown cinema, which would have been a bit of a flea pit. We went up to the Empire Leicester Square in the centre of London, which would have been a very, very extraordinary event for us as a family to do that. And I can remember where we sat. I can remember in Zhivago, we sat down the left-hand side of this huge screen right down near the front. And I'd have been incredibly young. And I remember... So vividly, the, the Cossack, you know, Lean's Cossack charge when the Cossacks break up the march, you know, that fantastic scene, and Strelnikov's at the front of the march, and Zhivar goes up on the balcony, and, you know, the Cossacks in the snow lining up, and the, the march with the band coming around the corner, and this collision, and, and the flashing swords, and the thunder of the hooves, and the blood, and the, just the, and the, and the, the sense of outrage that you felt as an audience and the shock and the horror and the, and, and the way that you went to Zhivago's character and you knew that it was going to impel him to live his life in the shadow of these events. And later, many, many years later, I made a film about a march, Bloody Sunday. Somewhere those cinematic, and that was just one, those, those cinematic experiences that mainline into your sort of cortex somewhere, I think are very, very important. Then I think it's to do with, and now I'm talking then, that's different now, the luck of being able to find access at an early age to moving cameras. Um, I'll, I at our school art room, they happened to have an old, like a little Bolex camera thing. And I pestered the art teacher to get some film for it, and that was the first film I ever made. And uh, that would have been quite unusual, you know, that you could find something like that. And I remember the thrill of seeing moving images for the first time projected on the wall in the, in the art room and thinking, oh, I like this. This is exciting. Um, I know. Then, then being able to go out to work, work at Granada and World in Action, and that was a very, very austere training ground, and you were taught in the shadow of the great John Grierson, the documentary realist tradition, and that that was the great golden thread that ran through British filmmaking, and you were taught to watch those films, and Nanook of the North, and Humphrey Jennings, and The Night Train, and you know, and onwards and onwards, and and. Um, so being trained in a tradition, I think, is very important. In very in rare now. Huh? Rare now, I think. Rare, but it's different now, you see, because um, moving images, are, are it's, it, the process is entirely democratized. And that's really, really important. And I think that one of the things that I find interesting is that I you know, before I came to this country to make films, you know, worked mainly in television in Britain. And, you know, I had tremendous, I was very lucky. I had, you know, complete sort of freedom to do what I want as long as I made them for about $4.35. Um, but, you know, but I made them and, and I was supported to make them, you know, and that was 
wonderful and I had no real particular aspirations to work here. It wasn't really part of my... I never thought anybody would have any interest in... You know, I was interested in sort of doing what I was doing. When I came here after I made Bloody Sunday, I, made, I decided to make a commercial film because I thought if I'm going to come to America and make a film, there's no point making a film like I could make in Britain. I wanted the fun of the fairground ride, you know, and the popcorn uh, ride. And also, I was quite enjoying the fact that in the first time in my life, I'd actually be paid some money, you know, <laughs> which was not something really that ever happened in Britain. Um, where directors are, you know, really abominably treated, but that's a different story. Um, so I wanted, and I was excited about the idea of making a commercial thriller. I'd never tried to do that. Mm -hmm. And I, I had very much enjoyed Doug Lyman's Bourne Identity. And, you know, a lot of people talk about the contribution I made to the Bourne franchise. Doug Lyman was the man who really had the vision to see what that Bourne franchise was about. And he created the character, you know. But I thought there were things I could do with it. And um, so we went off to make Bourne Supremacy. And I had a particular view, I think, about what an image was cinematically. It was, uh, you know, very fluid, very kinetic, very raw, very rough and handheld, and that came, I had developed that over time um, because it was where I started shooting, yeah. and it was the tradition that I was taught in, and I had operated thus far, I think, in what I considered to be quite a classical sort of British documentary realist yeah. tradition. Nobody really in Britain was using Zooms in the way that I was doing it, but I, f I felt quite old-fashioned, and I was quite comfortable in that. The weird thing was when I set out to make Supremacy and I started to, you know, shoot in that same way, but but in the vernacular of car chases and whatever it was, uh, it suddenly looked quite risque in a commercial context and, and sort of fresh and new. So I, I sort of went from being old-fashioned to being new kid on the block in about five minutes. And the funny thing was, it was when we were shooting the car chase that I first saw people with mobile phones recording. And of course, that's when I realized that the, the sort of cinematic audience were used in their own lives to seeing images that you know, would, would move in the wrist and be much more, um, you know, uh, much looser and rawer than anything that they were getting in mainstream cinema. And so when I started to give them what I consider to be quite old-fashioned images, they looked new to, to them. And I think that's kind of the interesting part of that collision, you know. Well, that's interesting because it, it, it dovetails with another point that I think uh, is, is really worth making. Last night... Um, another film that you referred to when you introduced um, Captain Phillips' Battle of Algiers by Gila Ponta Corvo. And, um, you know, David Lean and uh, Lawrence of Arabia and Dr. Shivago aside, your, your films in general have more of a, a link, I suppose, to what Ponta Corvo was doing in Battle of Algiers. And I suppose that the word that it really evokes for me is immediacy. And uh, yesterday during the press conference, the word environmental came up a lot. Um, you brought it up and so did Tom Hanks, and I think particularly in relation to the how that last scene in Captain Phillips came about. I would imagine that working the way that you do the environment becomes everything, and that you you know uh, that there are many um, instances that are like that. And w actually, maybe you could tell the audience about that, uh, how that scene came about. And in in Phillips, yeah. Well, it's always been important to me to try and shoot in real places, you know. Um, I mean, I've shot plenty in studios and enjoyed it. Um, it's good for your parking in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's never quite the same, I think, as the, the sort of excitement you get from being in a, in a location. 
Um, and things occur to you in locations. So in this film, Captain Phillips, it was important. You know, the, the sort of proposition going into it was that, you know, films on water, that's director's worst nightmare. And I, but I sort of felt that, on the contrary, it was the biggest opportunity with this film, which although it you know, looks quite a substantial film, actually was, was not a particularly expensive, well, it, no, it was a distinctly inexpensive film for what it was. And we were operating within those constraints. But I felt that if we could get the right ships, which principally meant a container ship and a, a US Navy ship, ships, and the skiffs and the lifeboat, that we'd have enough to make our film. And, and, and you know, it, very often when you're working with, you know, and this is true whether you're working on a tremendously low budget film or whatever, in the end you have to make judgments about where to put your resources. You know, you've got to say, well, and, and, and so often with filmmaking it's about making strong choices, strong committed choices. We'll go for this, but it will mean we won't be able to go for that. And I felt if we could do that, we would have the freedom to explore uh, the sort of authenticity of the experience. And it was true. It, 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 it gave the film that its sort of claustrophobia because even though some of those ships were big, actually they're incredibly claustrophobic. And uh, it created the compression and the drama that, that, that really drives the story, I think. But in the case of the last scene in the film, you actually created the scene um, after well, encountering the infirmary for the first time, right? Yes and no. I mean, I can tell you how that went. Um, it was always clear to, to us, I think, that, that somewhere you needed emotional catharsis, you know? And Tom and I had talked about you know, there would be a moment where you would break after that experience. And we'd actually tried to shoot that scene earlier in the day in the captain's cabin. The, the scene was about him being taken, uh, and we shot that scene. He, he, it was sort of after he'd been cleaned up, he was all, um, you know, dressed in back in a, in a sort of uniform of sorts. And he's taken up to the captain, Ca Castellano's cabin, and he's sitting alone. And he'd maybe be seeing kind of pictures on the TV of his homecoming and so on and so forth. Or, you know, the, the, his rescue. Yeah, the rescue and so forth. And he'd get a beer out the fridge and, you know, the, the sort of experience of being back in a normal world would somewhere create catharsis. And we shot that all day, really, you know, various different ways, you know, the walk in and, you know, people sort of, you know, a short scene with an orderly saying, you know, here's the thing and the beer's in the fridge and the, this is how you work the TV and, you know, the stuff. You're trying to sort of create a, a texture of, you know, sort of, of detail that can get you to somewhere. And Tom played it, and it was fine, but both of us knew it wasn't it. I w it it's like pebbles in a bucket, you know what I mean? They're rattling in the bucket, but it's not turning into anything. It's not, it's not real. It's not authentic. It's not truthful. And you're in that place which you can get to very often in films where it's not right. It's okay, it's perfectly good, but you don't even have to say to each other. You just know, each of you, that it's not, it's not it, it's not what you really need. And you run out of ways, you know, when you're directing, you're trying to sort of think, well, is there another way we can come at this? Well, what about if we do it this way? What about if we do it that way? What about if you do less? What about if you do more? You know, you're, you're, you're trying to find, it's, it's, like, it's like looking at a door or a rock face and you, you know that there's a key to unlock it. There's something the other side, but how do you find it? And sometimes 
you don't. And uh, I was talking to, I think, the captain or the XO, the number two, perhaps it was the XO, very nice man, very, very, what you'd expect a naval officer to be, very thoughtful man. And he said, I said, well, just run through if in that experience, from when he's taken off the boat, where would he actually go? Because we're picking him up now some hour or two. He's already had a shower, he's already dressed, you know. He said, well, the first place he'd be taken is the medical bay to be checked out. By now it was about half past five and we, we had very, we couldn't go late on those ships for all sorts of operational reasons. So we had just that hour and a half or whatever. And uh, he said, well, he'd go down to the medical bay. So I thought, oh, bollocks, we'll have to just try that, you know. It's like, it's the last roll of the dice. Okay, so let's go down. That's not an easy thing, by the way, moving around one of those ships. Let's, let's just get the gear quickly. We'll go in there. Is there a medic? Yes. Th there'll be a medical team because they're on duty now. Okay, is it all right if we go in there and we'll shoot and we'll be one out and then we'll be out of your hair? Fine, okay. Talk to Tom. Let's go and give it a go. Get your change back into, you know, because he obviously had to then be changed and blooded up and put back in costume change. You know, so you're running against the clock. Well, in a funny way, and I've found this quite often, if you can create a desperate urgency on a film set that's real, in other words, you're running out of time, you, we cannot come back to this, uh, you know, we're done, that's it, oh um, my God, we've got to do this costume change down, it's a makeup change, and that's going to be a minimum 15, 16 minutes, and we've got to move the gear, and we've got to set up, and we don't know who these people are down there, and we haven't even rehearsed the scene. Excuse me, what is this scene? You know, uh, and so everybody <laughs> inhabits a kind of a frenzy of chaos. It can be a good thing, because what happens is everybody starts to stop inhabiting a real world and starts to inhabit the world of sheer terror. In a good way. <laughs> and, and something happens. And we got down there. This is absolutely a true story. We got down there and, uh, you know, and Tom, this is, well, this is where great actors are great, when they're both great actors but also entirely up for it. You go, okay, we're going to just give it a go. We'll see. Okay, you're just going to be... I'm going to, there's two guards here, they're going to walk you down this corridor, you're going to go in there, there's a medical team, I don't want you to meet them. They'll just take it, I've talked to them, they're going to just take you in as a, as if this was a military exercise and you'd just come off the, you know, exactly there, they're, they're, this is an anti-piracy patrol ship, this has just happened and they'll take it from there. You've got the wounds on, you're dressed for, for with the blood and so on and so forth, they'll take it from there. Uh, Barry Ackroyd was with me. I said, okay, what we'll do is we'll go in over the shoulder and we'll crab to the left. It's a very tiny space. We'll go round to the... We've got to go left-hand ways anyway because otherwise we'll, we'll hit the light and, uh, and uh, we'll just go for it. Okay, right, go. Everyone's going... Uh, 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 uh. And, uh, you know, guy with video village. Where are well, we set up? Don't have time for that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you go and... Tom went through the door, and uh, the corm, uh, the corman, call woman. Um, she said, "Excuse me, what, what have I got to do?" I said, "Okay, well, Tom Hanks is going to come through that door, and he's going to be covered in blood. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. Just he's going to come through the door." And he, uh, okay, okay, really, really, it's, it's the XO. Okay with this? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, okay. <laughs> she immediately starts to tremble <laughs> like this. Okay, by now I'm going, this is going to be a disaster. It's never, ever going to work. And, uh, and Chris Carreras, my first day, he's going, we've got 33 minutes, okay? And then absolutely that's it. Okay, roll. We go, he, he walks in, Tom. She goes, uh, yeah, Captain Phillips, uh, uh, are you, uh, are you, uh, 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 she dries immediately because she suddenly realizes it's Tom Hanks. So she's going, <laughs> literally, it's true. It's absolutely true. She goes, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, meanwhile, Barry's crab round to the left per my instruction has now fallen over. And <laughs> <laughs> so the entire thing is a clusterfuck of epic proportions, you see. <laughs> and Tom's sitting there going, is anybody going to start doing anything here? <laughs> <laughs> but, but, in that moment when he came through the door, just before she dried, there was something about how she looked at him, and I could see it very clearly that it had landed with him. So we quickly reset, pulled out. Um, we had to freshly dress uh, the blood on on. Tom, wipe him down and dress. So I went round the corner with him and I said, did, did you feel that? Something happened in there? He said, no, no, definitely. He said, definitely, definitely. I, I, felt, I felt different because I was going into that very antiseptic, tiny space and these people were being procedural. It all felt procedural because they were putting things on my fingers and even though she dried, it just felt there was something there. And that's when you see the truth about great acting because great acting is not really about lines it is sometimes it's really about having the courage to identify when a, a door towards truth is just a little bit open there is something there and acting is about feeling the truth feeling where the truth lies in a scene feeling where the truth lies in a moment and then having the courage to hunt it down. And uh, so I knew then that he'd seen what I'd seen. And of course, it was because he'd felt it. You know, it was, it was, there was something in there to be had. And I could see in his eyes that he was going to go for it. You know, it was like a, and that's the will toward truth that great actors have when it's real. And then I it was about just settling her down and getting her, you know, listen, this is just an exercise. Forget us. Forget it's him. I just want you to be in a military exercise. You've done many of them, and this is a casualty coming in. And then we shot the scene again, and I think we did actually three or possibly four takes, not very many. Yeah. And fundamentally, it was just two and three, the first one being the bust. And you felt as soon as he walked through the door, she clicked into being entirely as procedural. Mm -hmm. And somewhere I could just see him break because, because it was truthful. Because suddenly after all those hours of being manhandled and guns putting in his face, there was this person who was just trying to fix him up. But she wasn't sentimentalizing. It was entirely She's procedural. Yeah, and it, yeah. And that's where the truth lay. And then you get that extraordinary uh, vulnerability, humanity, that, that Tom Hanks can find. And that's why he is a great actor. But then to... to uh <laughs> take the whole environmental question a little further. I know that uh, on the flip side was the experience of shooting inside the, the lifeboat. Um, the sick created boat. created a different kind of, yeah, the sick boat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> created a different kind of problem, right? Yes, I remember we started shooting. The first day uh, we started shooting properly in the lifeboat. We'd been in it a few times, so I wanted everybody to acclimatize. climb time. I'm actually quite lucky. I don't, my father was at Sea of Life, so and not that I went with him very much, but I don't really get seasick, luckily. It's just a thing you either something to do with your inner ear, you either do or you don't. Anyway, we, this was the first um, uh, day that we really were shooting in the lifeboat for real, out on the ocean, and that thing, it pitches, it you know, yaws, it turns through every access, it's it thumps down, so there's a lot of this as well. And uh, and it's low, the windows are up here, you're sitting down on the f seats are here, you're cramped in like that, it stinks of of diesel. It's a, it's a brutal craft. So we started the scene, I can't even remember what the scene was, they were all in there. 
obviously on that occasion I was on a little camera boat next door because we couldn't, we had two cameras and we were shooting across so there was nowhere really for me to sit in there. Um, but I had a walkie in there to, to um, Chris, my first. Anyway, we started shooting and the scene wasn't going very well. And there was a long pause and then I had a radio message. Um, the focus pull is a bit seasick. So I said, okay, well, just keep effing shooting, will you? Okay, pause. Scene doesn't go very well. Um, the focus pull has just been sick all over Tom. <laughs> just keep shooting, will you? <laughs> See, um, Barry's now been sick too. <laughs> a camera's down. <laughs> okay, just keep shooting. Uh, sorry. Correction. B camera down too. He's sick too. <laughs> so it went on until there was literally everybody in there was seasick and there was poor old Tom who never got seasick just sitting <laughs> there, you know, with people puking their guts out <laughs> left, right and centre being casi out of this thing and I thought Okay, we've, it, the good news is we've only got about 56 days of this to go. <laughs> That's absolutely true. <laughs> anyway, we got there. <laughs> um, to, you know, to return to something that you said before, you were saying that the world of moving images and the world of, of movie making is now democratized. And that, so is it fair to say that the way that your approach to making movies has, that, that maybe it changed when you saw um, during that, when you were shooting the car chase, people holding up those cameras, that you that, that it brought you to a different place and that your your films in some way um, become almost mosaics of present tense um, images. Yeah. yeah. I think it challenges me, yeah. to be honest. I, I, I now, you know, do you... If you have a distinctive style, do you accept that as the authentic expression of yourself? Or do you try and learn some different dances? Mm -hmm. That's a big question. Mm -hmm. I don't think I know the answer to that. I, I, I do sometimes think Maybe I should do something different, but it never feels to be truthful to me, you know? Uh, I think that the great, great filmmakers, the greatest filmmakers, can operate in lots of different areas, you know? And I wouldn't put myself in that, you know, in those, because I just think but I think that I do what I do, you know, and it is authentically me. It comes, uh, you know, I don't put it on. I mean, sometimes I see stuff, you know, and it's like they're waving the camera around, particularly on television, and you go, well, th but what's the point of that? It's just some, sort of jump, some generalized sort of thing that says immediacy, but it's really not. It's not, it's not, it's not rooted in physically where you are or why it would be shot in that way or I mean you know, the truth is you couldn't have shot this film in any other way than this unless we'd said well we're not really on the ocean we're on a stage and we'll break that craft in half and then we'll put dollies in and you know that would be a different experience um, a movie from a different era also. yeah I mean I, 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 in the end I, I think that I'm probably from being uh, working within a classical tradition in Britain, if you know what I mean, and then this phase where it became sort of more cinematically modern mm -hmm. in the commercial mainstream, and I suspect I'll probably transition back to being quite old-fashionedly me, and that'll be quite cool. Um, but uh, I don't know, it's, it's hard. It, definitely having an, a, a sort of distinctive style is a is a can be a straitjacket for yourself, not least because I remember uh, some years ago after I can't remember after I'd done the Bourne movies, somebody was saying, uh, "Oh, there was some guy from I can't remember which studio it was come into town. This is in London, 
uh, I was having lunch with a friend of mine who was, who was an, an agent in London. He said, yeah, this guy from a studio was coming in town. And apparently he was looking for the new Paul Greengrass. I said, hang on a second, the old one's still here and available. <laughs> Anyway, um, take a couple questions from the audience. If any, yes. Um, yes oh, somebody's like a bringing a mic so that the whole audience can hear. There you go. Um, since you've popularized the shaky cam style in mainstream cinema, it's really hard to remember just how groundbreaking it was at the time. So I was wondering, how did you initially convince the studio on Born Supremacy to let you work in this shaky cam, very loose, improvisational, non-storyboard style, and what were their initial impressions before it worked? Um, well, I think they were, uh, well, I think two things. I think they were, they hired me and I, you know, the films that I'd made before that, you know, Bloody Sunday being one, were pretty clear, you know, how it looked. Um, but I still remember them sitting down, we were shooting in Berlin, the first sort of early rushes session. I'm not a great one for watching my rushes, incidentally. It's, it's not something I tend to dwell on, only because I'm always intent on driving forward. I'm, I'm very, very interested in material cut quickly, because that tells me something much more important than I can learn from rushes, you know. I'll watch rushes if I think there's something wrong, or if I think I haven't covered something properly, I'll check. But joining my first big movie, there was the tradition of rushes being screened at such and such a time. And I remember the first <laughs> of rushes hearing people behind me, people in authority whose names I won't mention. Okay. <laughs> what the fuck? What, what the fuck? What, why the fuck? Why does he have to do that? <laughs> but look at Jesus. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, they were very good to me as well. You know, they really were. They were good to me because the odd thing about Hollywood, in my experience, is that they, they want you to know what you're doing. They don't, the idea that they sit around trying to find ways of interfering with directors' work is, I, I, in my experience, and now I'm not exactly the new kid on the block anymore, so wide of the mark. On the contrary, they want you to come in with a strong point of view. They want you to say, here's how I do it, I do it like this. And you're accountable for that, of course, but they want, you know, they want to know what you want to do. And they did. I mean, there was a, on that first film, there was a certain amount of, I used to sort of have to shoot the scene like a grown-up director. And then, you know, I'll do the little dolly and then the two shot and down to the teacup, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> Which I did, I learned how to, you know, I can do that, easy, not a problem. Um, and then we'd ship on out, and in the last couple of hours we'd shoot it properly, or how I would like it to shoot it. <laughs> so there was a certain amount of that. Right up, actually, till the end, I remember the reshoots being told, and we still, we want, we don't want all that shaky cam. You can do it, but we want it done the other way too. But once they realised it worked, they were, they were great. They were fine with me. But they didn't know, you see, whether audiences would tolerate it. That was the point. That was what nobody knew, really. Would a, would a wide, m mainstream audience, movie-going audience, you know, which would be younger, would they accept it? And it was when that film started to, you know, work that they realised, that's what I'm saying, that... that that the, their movie audiences were much more conversant with those images yes, than they knew. That's what I mean. That that was the real thing. And now that's now it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Um, 
Yeah, um, Mr. Greengrass, my, my question is, um, the film Captain Phillips, has it already been shown to Somali diaspora in the US, Canada, or maybe Kenya? And if so, what feedback has been received? And would you also, could you also foresee if the conditions should permit showing it in one day in Mogadishu, Hergesa, or Garoe to see what the Somali community um, thinks about it abroad as well as in, in Somalia? Well, the, the answer to the first part of the question is, I, I think they are planning exactly that, but obviously uh, last night's the first time the film's ever been shown, so I think that, that process is ongoing. I can't tell you off the top of my head exactly when it's going to be shown, but yes, and, it, and it, of course it will get an overseas uh, life, you know, these days, one of the one of the most wonderful things I think about about um, making a film is that it, you you're now so much more aware of its international, uh, its its global life. You know, um, yeah, it used to be that it was sort of predictable places, but now m movie. Uh, you know, the movie experience, the cinema travels globally and deeply globally, you know, all around the world in many, many, many territories, and you do get that feedback. And I, I'm really looking forward to to seeing that. And, I, and it, it has always seemed to me in this film, though we'll live to see whether, you know, that, that by casting young Somalis to play those parts and to render this story with, with you know, a reasonable degree of authenticity gives it a, uh, a, an ability to be seen much more broadly internationally, you know, because it doesn't seem to be, uh, you know, uh, limited in one perspective. It's a, it's, a, it's a global story, I think, this story. Many, many countries are affected by piracy. And, you know, uh, the issues that it raises, you know, this is a sort of simple dramatic story, but the issues that, that it sort of illuminates are, are global, you know, so I hope it will do. As to whether it will be shown in Mogadishu, I hope so. I hope so. I can find out for you. I'd, I, I'd, I would really hope so. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a very, very vibrant place. We know Somalia, of course, uh, you know, for its fragmentation and its, you know, its poverty and its warlordism and the civil war and all the problems of, you know, piracy on the one hand and al-Shabaab on the other. You know, it's a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a case study in a failed state, you know. Um, but in the end, you know, Somali people are resilient people, uh, creative people, tremendous, tremendous um, uh, musical traditions, uh, poetic traditions, uh, you know, Somali writing, Somali culture. Um, you know, we just have to hope that in the end, as a society, it can rebuild itself um, and that these problems of piracy and the rest of it can fade away. That would be my hope, anyway. It's a microphone here. I guess you um, mentioned casting young Somali actors, and going back to United 93, you sort of used um, sort of unknowns or people who, um, I guess, weren't stars or people who we didn't really know. And with this, obviously you have one of the biggest movie stars in the world, Tom Hanks. Was it a conscious choice for you then to cast unknown Somali actors because of that? And is that something that you find helpful when dealing with these kinds of stories? Non-actors, right? Yeah, I mean, um, well, it wasn't the decision to go that way with the Somali actors was not because of Tom. It was, it was driven by the fact that I had decided to make the film with, you know, some some certain core principles of authenticity in mind. One of which was to shoot it on real 
vessels and the other of which was to get Somalis to play Somali. Um, so it wasn't related to Tom. It just felt to me like they were fundamental choices you had to make. Um, and once having made them, I didn't see a difference in the sense. You know, I mean, obviously you're aware that Tom is a fantastic the experienced actor and certainly you know I'd be aware of the would those young actors be able to stand up and go ahead to particularly bark at Abdi who plays Musi be able to do the business opposite Tom but but it wasn't cause and effect like that does that make sense yeah um, uh, you know in terms of you know chops as we'd say you know has have actors got the chops for it you you never know. You just have to to believe and hope. And in and I always thought that those guys could do it. And I always absolutely believed that Barkad could do it. And he could. You know, you don't acting is is many, many things, right? Many, many things. It's 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 a, about technique. It's about um, you know having uh, being able to access emotional states with tremendous accuracy. Uh, but it's also about will, you know, as any actor will know. It's about having that will to project to another human being who's acting with your beings with such force and such focus that it projects with tremendous power when, you know, when photographed. And that inner will is inborn. You know, it's, a, it's to do with hunger, desire, need. There are things inside that, that only the performing can exercise. And that's what I found with Barkhead. He had that. In, he's an actor. You know, he's a, he's a, you don't fashion a performance with... You can fashion maybe a few moments, but to fashion a performance with a character to, to get that degree of complexity in that character without ever sentimentalizing him. So you're clear about his menace and his, his absolute determination to kidnap Phillips and take him back, you know, and to sketch in the forces that operate in his world upon him and to find some sense of humanity in that, you know, dark character without sentimentality across a performance opposite Tom Hanks. That's, that's, that's just acting. That's just brilliant acting. And he's, he's got, he's the real deal, in my view. You know, and I think the evidence is up there. And I certainly, Tom thinks so too, because he, he would know better than I, because he's right there with him, you know. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today, but Paul, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you for the